Mr. Chancellor, colleagues, graduating students, and distinguished guests, it's with great pleasure this morning that I present to you Dr. Haviva Hosek. Dr. Hosek has had a remarkable career and in her various leadership capacities in education, science, and politics has instigated transformational change. She received an undergraduate degree and her PhD in English literature from Harvard in 1973. She then went on faculty at the University of Toronto, where she strengthened the Women's Studies program and was the first woman to chair the Academic Affairs Committee of the University's Governing Council. Her leadership as a model and advocate of women's rights led her to serve as president of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women from 1984 to 1986, during which time she received numerous Women of the Year awards. Between her dedication as an educator, an activist, a mentor, and a role model, Dr. Hosek has had a profound effect on the lives of many women. And as remarkable as she's been in raising the bar for what women can achieve, I've also seen her share empathetic conversations with young women as they consider the sacrifices they feel they have to make to achieve their dreams and aspirations. She understands these choices not as a fact that must be accepted, but rather that as a society, we must continue to advocate for social change. Dr. Hosek also contributed to Canada's social agenda more broadly. She was a member of Ontario's provincial parliament, during which time she served as the Minister of Housing and advanced the issue of social housing. She later became the director of the Liberal Party of Canada's Caucus Research Bureau, and along with Paul Martin, she co-authored the party's Red Book. Under Jean Chrétien, Dr. Hosek was appointed the Director of Policy and Research in the Prime Minister's Office and wrote the Liberal platforms for the 1997 and 2000 federal elections. In 2001, Dr. Hosek became President and CEO of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, also known as CIFAR, where her efforts served to enhance Canada's reputation as a global leader in the international scientific community. She was visionary in setting and advancing the agenda of this prestigious organization that brings together the best researchers in the world to work together on the next big question. The programs under CIFAR have been at the frontiers of knowledge by bringing greater understanding to questions such as, what is the nature of gravity? Why, given all of the technical advances of today, are we still using computer keyboards? What makes some societies more successful than others? What makes up who you are as a person, your genes, your relationships with others, or your culture? Dr. Hosek has played a pivotal role in bringing together researchers from around the world from multiple disciplines to work together to answer such questions. She has been a passionate and convincing advocate of science and its importance to us globally. She has just completed her term as CEO at CIFAR, and I know she's going to be very greatly missed. Mr. Chancellor, in recognition of her transformational role in advancing Canada's reputation as a global leader in the international research community, I request that you confer the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa upon Haviva Hosek. By virtue of my authority, I confer upon you this degree of Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the honor you've bestowed upon me. I'm also happy to congratulate all the people who are receiving their degrees today, their friends, their families, and their teachers. I assume you feel both excitement and relief at having accomplished this goal and are either planning what's next or wondering what's next. In my experience, the best reward for having done good work is the opportunity to do more good work. And if you've been paying any attention at all to the world, you know the world needs a lot of improvement. I hope to convince you that you have the tools to make a contribution to fixing the world. I'm not suggesting you should abandon your brand new career plans to do that. On the contrary, I urge you to use your education and your career 
so that the work you will do will contribute to improving the world. Those of you who've studied business, management, and commerce have the tools with which to create commercial value and to enhance prosperity. Those of you who've studied engineering have had both class and co-op experience in defining the kinds of problems that can be solved with the skills of mathematics, the physical sciences, and engineering. Those of you who've studied architecture, urbanism, design, and industrial design have been trained in the critical thought processes of design which link efficacy, making things that work, to aesthetic values and elegance. And those of you who've been studying information technology and the new materials in which that technology can now be used are in the field whose knowledge has transformed and will continue to transform all the others. You're all positioned for leadership in the new economy, an economy that's not so new since it has emerged all over the world in the last 20 or so years. Researchers at CIFAR, the institute that I had the honor of leading for the past 11 and a half years, have studied the effect of general purpose technologies on economic growth since the start of the Industrial Revolution. General purpose technologies are technologies like information technology that transform the way that work is done and the way that we live. Those researchers have found that it takes at least 40 years between the introduction of a new technology like that and the invention of the many ways in which it could be used. We tend to use new technology to do the things we were doing before with the older technology. And it takes quite a long time before we discover the things that the new technology enables us to do that were impossible to do before. Some of you will remember Marshall McLuhan, another great Canadian, who made a similar point about the media of communication, writing that, reminding us that at first writing was used to replicate speech. People said things to each other and then they wrote it down. Movies replicated stage plays. Television replicated radio. And it took quite a while before the special capacities of any new medium were discovered and exploited. If it takes at least 40 years until the special capabilities of a new technology are truly discovered, then we are less than halfway through the process of finding out or inventing what we can do with those new technologies to change the world. Now, when any of us first begin to learn something new, we copy the people and processes that have come before us. We learn from our teachers what our teachers already know. We become capable by imitation, by copying, and hoping to achieve mastery in that way. And that's hard enough work, as you all know, because you've been doing it for a number of years. There's so much to know, and in fact, these days, none of us can any longer hope to master what is known in any of our fields of study because there is just so much accumulated knowledge, more accumulated knowledge than any single mind can hope to keep. I wish we could say the same thing about wisdom, but maybe we'll get there someday too. So if the human race is going to go beyond what we already know, it requires different ways of thinking and working. And my experience at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research has given me great hope about what people can accomplish if they work together in a spirit of openness and trust. To answer our big questions, we have to break down the barriers between disciplines because despite their prodigious strength, every discipline, every form of analysis has its own limitations. In order to answer questions of great complexity, we need to collaborate with other people who know things we don't know and who, thinks in way, who think in ways that are different from the ways we think. That isn't as easy as it sounds, because all of us, and you remember this because you remember what you've done over the last few years, we've all made investments of time and effort, and sometimes tears, to learn what we already think we've accomplished in knowing. So it's not a matter of people getting together for a weekend and drinking beer and somehow passing on the knowledge of different disciplines to each other. It takes time and effort. We need to go beyond the largely analytic thinking in which we've all been trained, in which we achieve understanding by breaking things and ideas down into their component parts. New thinking requires a willingness to explore and to take risks. If you already know your destination and how to get there, it's not an exploration. It requires an ability to use your imagination to go where there are no maps yet and to learn how to do things we have not yet seen done by others. It's only through exploration 
and the disciplined use of the imagination that we will create new, new frameworks of understanding and expand human possibility. The problems we already know about are enormous. How do we feed the nine billion people who will soon be sharing this planet? How can there ever be enough clean water for all of us? How can we live when, we, when even more of us will live in enormous cities with multi-millions of people? How will we find a way to share the wealth and resources more fairly around the world? How can we share a small planet better so that fewer of us die of violence? How will we do all this without destroying the ecological base on which all life depends? Now, I don't expect either you or me to solve problems of this scale, but every business that is able to be commercially viable while using fewer resources and a smaller ecological footprint moves us along. Every building that uses energy and water more efficiently moves us along. Every community designed to increase the sociability of the people who live there. Every industrial design that makes it possible for people with mobility and other mobility issues to participate in the world. Every schoolyard that can also be used to grow food. Every work project that can involve people from different parts of the world working successfully together every computer game that's also a tool for learning and enables people to cooperate. All these things move us along. These examples already exist in the world, as you know. But more creativity will create more such solutions, ones that I certainly have not thought of, but that some of you will. So as you go into the work world, I urge you to look for opportunities to continue to learn, to choose when you can, projects that bring both economic and technical success and results that are ethical and improve the condition of the human race. If you have opportunities to work with people from different backgrounds and disciplines, take them. If your work brings you in contact with people from other parts of the world, make the most of the opportunity to understand how they think and what they value, which may be different from how you think and what you value. Now, as people who've had the great good luck to be educated in a Canadian university, you've already had more of that opportunity than most people ever do, because the whole world already lives here. Like your friends, family, and teachers, I have great hopes for you and for your capacity to improve the world. We need you. Congratulations on your graduation day. <laughs>